going to continue uh, this afternoon, as you can sort of see here in the background, it was on the waiting list here. So we had, we have two speakers this afternoon. The first will be Roland Fleck. Uh, Roland was at the National Institute of Biological Standards and Controls for some time. And then he went to King's College in London in 2013. And so uh, he's been, or he's an expert in all sorts of advanced imaging techniques and especially in electron microscopy. Uh, I visited his lab shortly before the pandemic, uh, pandemic and he's uh, got a fantastic lab and lots of excellent equipment and great personnel, great people running the things. So he has a very good team running there. Uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of background about Roland because I think it's more important to mention that he has probably been in most of the major uh, core centers throughout Brazil and Latin America, and not, not just here, but around the world. Roland travels, uh, I've never seen anyone travel, a scientist travel as much as he does. So uh, he's always, he'll be here again in uh, November. I think he's, it's in November. Uh, Workshop yeah, that's great. Right. November, December. And Ribeirão Preto, so there will be a workshop coming up for that. And uh, he's always, uh, he, I have to just say this one comment, so he, he loves to go do workshops, but then on the weekends when he's in some foreign country, he, he runs races. So he's, he and I are both runners, so, or I should okay. say, he is now. <laughs> I've, just, I've just entered one for the next trip, actually, halfway between... Um, um, Minas and uh, Sao Paulo. <laughs> I found one. <laughs> so he always sort of uses these meetings to do his running and training. So it's it's an interesting. I, I think Roland, correct me if this is wrong, but I think you told me once that you'd run in fifty one different countries. Uh, God, I haven't added up, but you probably something daft like that. Yeah, because I do park runs if I can't find anything major. Um, yeah, no, pretty much every country I've visited, uh, I've run in. Yeah, so we... And, and I, th I think on travelling, I think Angus Kirkland has me beat hands down. He travels far more than I do. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like you've travelled a lot. So, but Roland also, I have to, to mention Roland, uh, he's got this affinity for Brazil or seems to have affinity for Brazil and he's... He's definitely been one of the instrumental researchers here in, in our institute or in our core center here in, in Minas and in Belo Horizonte, UFMG. Uh, early on, uh, uh, he became a visiting professor here and was able to come a couple of times, once or twice a year over a several year period. And he's held many, many workshops here in the center of microscopy. And it was, uh, the best and most efficient way for us to be able to get uh, the expertise with all of the people that are working in cryo -EM and different methods that we have here, all, all of them primarily uh, in the direction of biological preparation and analysis. And so he's been instrumental in helping us buy microscopes and equipment and material here. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for him to come and um, talk about his research here now. So Roland, I think, be sure I can let you share already. So Greg, thank you very much. Uh, I'll quietly knock off my video and hopefully get the screen sharing working. And then I, I should have time for questions at the end for everybody. Thanks a lot, Greg, for that. Thank you. Okay, Greg, you should. Yeah, I'm seeing see here. Presentation, is that correct? Yes, looks good to me here. Okay, wonderful. I've only got about half the screen, so uh, I should be fine. <laughs> it's with a little bit of jiggling around of screens here. Excellent. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me to present um, only virtually this time, uh, physically in uh, University of Sao Paulo at the end of um, December, uh, November, beginning of December. and. Hopefully, Greg and, and Minas again next year if, if your course comes off. So fingers crossed, I'm looking forward to it. So I think for today's presentation, I'm coming before um, Rodrigo Portugal. So R Rodrigo's a real expert in structural biology, and I'm going to touch on aspects of 
sample preparation for structural biology during my presentation, but but not in great detail. He'll cover it extensively during his his presentation following mine. What I'm going to do is try and cover the cryo EM sample preparation workflow, essentially aimed at life science samples, biological samples, for want of a better description. Um, a lot of people consider them really novel, high-end, difficult, challenging, um, throw any word you wish into that equation. Um, but basically, a lot of people steer away from them because they believe that they are not appropriate for their EM units or too challenging to employ in their research. Um, that's really far from the case and far from the truth. You might need specialist equipment for some of the higher end techniques, but most of them are quite approachable. And the benefits you gain in terms of ultrastructural resolution and accessibility of the tissue really made them worthwhile. So really, they, are, they shouldn't really be considered as novel. They should be considered as an essential part of anybody's workflow for um, basic tissue or cellular research. So a quick 101 for people who aren't familiar with electron microscopy, we're going to really cover two types of electron microscope during the course of the presentation. So this is just a quick overview to sort of set the stage as much as anything else. We essentially have two types of microscope in the electron microscopy facility, a scanning electron microscope, SEM, or transmission electron microscope, TEM. Um, shown here on the slide, the one on the left is your SEM. Essentially, the the system has a column, uh, an emission source, which generates the electrons, which go down through the column and illuminate the specimen. In this case, your condenser and objective lens are above the specimen as the specimen is excited with the electrons or, or imaged. Um, you know, electrons are scattered either as a backscatter signal or a secretary signal picked up in the detector and read out in some sort of monitor or screen. And this is really how you're generating your image. It's fairly straightforward. The nice thing about it actually is it gives you quite a lot of topography in your image. So you're scattering a secondary electron. It's essentially similar to how light works when your eye, the light hits a wall or an object and then reflects back and you see it in your eye. And as a result of that, you get a little bit of contrasting, you can see shadowing, and it lets you, you build an impression of an object as being three-dimensional. And the SCM gives you much the same sort of data. On the other side, you have the transmission electron microscope. So the TEM um, transmits the electrons, uh, hence its name. So essentially the electrons come from somewhere above the sample, they go down, pass through the specimen, and then generate a, a pattern, an image below it. Now, as a result of that, it does have um, a couple of inherent limitations. The first one being that this lovely three-dimensional happy smiley face that we have as a specimen, by the time it forms its image, is really an average of a, of a three-dimensional structure. And that in itself actually makes it extremely difficult to understand what happens in a cell or a tissue or a membrane in three dimensions. And actually the third dimension is really critically important in all cellular and biological research. So this is something which is critical and you have to be aware of it when you're working in electron microscopy. I'm gonna come on to this later on in the presentation, but this is just to give you a starting point for those who aren't familiar with EM as a technique. The other thing that's worth considering at this point in time is that actually most biology, life science samples, are really inherently incompatible with the electron microscope. They're principally made of water. Um, they're also primarily made up of light elements. So water and high vacuum don't really go together particularly well. Um, and light elements scatter electrons very poorly, so they don't generate an awful lot of contrast. And as a result of that, you get very, very poor images in your electron microscope. So what we have to do is modify them in some way. So we treat them. We treat them in a manner which makes them resistant to the high vacuum environment. We make them resistant to the electron beam. This is an example of a 200 kV, 200,000 electron volt transmission electron microscope. So you're firing 200,000 electron volts at your sample. So you have to make it slightly more resistant um, to electrons than, than we are normally. And you have to make it thin enough for the electrons to penetrate through the sample, certainly in the case of the transmission electron microscope, to collect and generate that image below the specimen. And somehow you have to introduce contrast. And contrast is really just another way of describing how I separate one membrane from the surrounding background that it's placed within. So making a membrane dark in the background light is really what we're aiming for. Anything we do to these samples essentially will introduce some form of change in the specimen. You can't really get away from it. We have some techniques and some of the cryo techniques 
are intended to be as artifact free as possible, but everything will introduce some degree of artifact um, during the course of preparation. And I'll discuss that throughout the course of the presentation. But this is really the mainstay of all good life science electron microscopy, understanding when and where you introduce the artifact and how you can avoid them and the impact of a particular artifact on your data set. If you're, create, if you're looking at a volume change in a cell or a tissue and you subject it to a high osmotic stress and lots of processing before you image it, the processing artifacts will actually result in quite significant changes in volume before you even get to doing your measurement. So there'd be an artifact which would be considered unacceptable if you were carrying out that type of study. So it's really critical to work through your experimental design to understand where you may or may not introduce artifacts and avoid the ones which are going to be critical in, in your data analysis. I mentioned how the transmission electron microscopes work. So this is just an idea of the, the image being formed by the transmitting electron going through the specimen and generating a two-dimensional average of, of, of the original 3D sample. We do have a technique called tomography, um, which works for both room temperature and cryotechniques, where you essentially you take this sample and you tilt it inside the electron beam. And as you tilt it, you continue to take images all the way through the tilt series, and then you apply a weighted back projection to them to generate in the three-dimensional volume, which is associated with the original sample. And this is a way to actually overcome the limitations of the 2D imaging uh, that you have in a transmission electron microscope. So these are really the two strategies, either the, the topographic imaging approach, which you have with the scanning electron microscope or tilting and tomography in the transmission electron microscope. So if you have these available at your fingertips, you can then progress into understanding your sample preparation techniques and the workflows to, to, to understand your, your, your biological question. So Greg's asked me to talk about novel techniques or, or I would say essential techniques in life science research, and these are the cryo ones. So as far as we're concerned today, that's the right-hand side of this particular table, uh, right-hand side of the dotted line over here. So you can break down your cryo techniques into two essentially um, separate categories. There are the pure cryo techniques, where the sample remains frozen in the cryogenic state throughout its entire processing workflow right through until it's imaged. So in this case, what you're trying to do is use low temperature to fix tissue and then somehow maintain it in its frozen state and then image it without any former further changes to the sample itself, any warming, melting, etc. Your other techniques are essentially hybrid ones where you're only using the low temperature initially fix the sample and then from there, you're converting it through some particular workflow to make it room temperature stable. One main route, which is very common, would be freeze substitution, where we sublime away the water at very low temperatures, replacing it with resins and solvents, or solvents and resins, before curing the resin, bringing it up to room temperature, in this case, giving you a, a room temperature stable sample for imaging in the transmission electron microscope or something slightly more sophisticated or, or esoteric like Takayashi technique, where essentially we're using um, high molarity sucr sucr solutions, sucrose in most cases, to allow you to vitrify the tissue. I'm going to discuss this in detail in the coming slides, but essentially it means you can end up with a nice solid frozen block of tissue, easily frozen block of tissue, which can then be cut and sectioned using an ultramicrotome, warmed to room temperature, and these room temperature sections are actually available for immunogold labeling. And essentially, this allows you to use an electron microscope in much the same way as you use a confocal microscope, where you use a fluorescent label, an antibody tag to fluorophore to mark up a feature or, or structure of interest. And in this case, what we would do is we'd use an, an electron dense gold particle, a gold ball tagged to your antibody. And that in itself would then label the structure of interest allowing you to make a, a, a conclusive identification of what you're working with. Other ways of actually getting your samples up to room temperature would be freeze fracture, um, freeze etch, followed by um, cleaning of the replica um, for imaging in the transmission electron microscope. I'll discuss it a little bit later on, but we tend to use the, the freeze fracture approach now to go into the trio SEM. Again, I'll highlight that later on. Okay, so if we move into the low temperature environment, if it was that easy, we would all be doing it. Um, th this is really where people start to get put off doing cryo techniques. 
low temperature is really not a great place for cells and tissues. As we all know, if you cool down things in the fridge, they tend to freeze and ice crystals do an awful lot of damage to biological tissue. Um, the figure here gives you an idea of what happens in different ways of cooling. A normal growth for a for most mammalian cells and tissues is going to be around about 37 degrees C. Um, if you cool them, you can hyperthermically stress them, and that in itself can introduce ultrastructural changes in, in the tissue itself. It can damage membranes um, and, and the like, and it will affect some of the fluid dynamics over side, either side of a membrane. So if you if you introduce this sort of change in your tissue, it's really not ideal if you wanted to preserve it in its ideal state. Taken a little bit colder, you'll start to see ice formation, and this will tend to happen in an extracellular environment. And what that does is that imposes an osmotic gradient across the cell membrane. And as a result of that, you will start to dehydrate or cryodehydrate your cell or your tissue block. If you cryodehydrate it extremely slowly for an extended period of time, you'll actually shrink the cell down to an incredibly small volume to the extent that actually its intercellular space is so concentrated that it will actually form a glass, it will vitrify, um, and this is a metastable state of water. Um, but the, the ultrastructure of that particular cell is, is almost certainly grossly damaged to a point that it's essentially unrecognizable from how it was in its living state. For cryopreservation purposes, if you wanted to bring this thing back to life afterwards, you're looking at what is marked up here as the ideal cooling rate. And in this situation, you would sufficiently cryodehydrate the intracellular space to a point where the cytoplasmic space was concentrated to the point that on plunging into liquid nitrogen, it would vitrify, but it wasn't excessively dehydrated to a point that it was actually lethal to the cell. And if you cool fairly rapidly, and um, perhaps plunging directly into liquid nitrogen without slow cooling, you'll get ice crystals absolutely everywhere, and that, that will cause gross destruction and damage to any organelle and cell or tissue which you're working with. Now, in electron microscopy, we tend to try to follow this direct straight line with something which is marked up as very fast cooling. So the intention here is actually to go from the living state with a nice happy cell to one which is vitrified, so essentially locked in a glassy state. Um, and when this happens, there's no change to the osmotic state of the cell, there's no change to the positions of you know, um, the, the solutes or, or electrolytes which are present in or around the cell, and it's essentially perfectly preserved. However, very fast cooling is really determined as something in the range of about a million degrees C per second. You, it's very, very fast cooling, and cooling something at that speed is, is actually extremely challenging. This is one of the primary problems with cryo-electron microscopy. However, if you can do it, it has a lot of major advantages. So you, your immobilization is extremely fast to reach this vitrified state. So that actually gives you superbly great time resolution. The temporal resolution on a cryopreserved sample is, is in milliseconds. So it, it, it's extremely good in terms of time resolution. If you compare and contrast that to chemical fixation, it could take a minute, a couple of minutes to fully cross link and fix a cell. So a lot of biology could happen in that period of time. So from that point of view, you get great time resolution. There's no loss of ions or molecules. You're not extracting any lipids. There's no depolymerization of proteins. You're not denaturing your enzymes. Membranes maintain the original permeability. For the pure cryo techniques where you're using vitrification without um, cryoprotectants being present, you shouldn't see any osmotic effects, which means there'll be no or very reduced shrink shrinkage of your, your cellular tissue. And in the case of things like um, Takayashi technique and high pressure freezing, free substitution, antigenicity can be preserved, which allows you to employ immunogold labeling to, to label your tissue and structures of interest. And really what you're having to do is consider the physical properties of water to, to perform, perform these techniques successfully. So the vitrification step is probably the most difficult step in, in electron microscopy. The easiest way to vitrify the tissue is to employ cryoprotectants. And this is really what the Tokiashu technique uses. The sample is lightly fixed in formaldehyde essentially to give a little bit of protection against the introduction of, of sucrose. You don't want to excessively change the, the volume of the sample. 
it's also embedded in a low temperature gelling agarose or, or to, to help hold the tissue together for, from the, for freezing. But the critical point is introducing the high molarity sugar. And the sugar acts as a cryoprotectant, which prevents ice crystal formation during freezing. And because the cryoprotectant is present in, in high molarity situation, you can achieve vitrification of this sample by plunging it directly into liquid nitrogen. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of Tokyashu data and then in the coming slides. But taking it a little bit further forward, the reason we can't use this approach on, of just plunging directly into liquid nitrogen without cryoprotectants is because of something called the Leiden frost effect. So in the, the early 17th century, the Reverend Johann Leidenfrost essentially understood a process where a liquid um, which is warmed will generate a vapour phase of that liquid and the vapour itself will act as an insulator between the warming surface and the, the liquid itself. You can see this most mornings if you make a fried breakfast, if you heat up the frying pan and you get some water in your hand and splash some droplets of water onto the frying pan, you'll see little droplets of water flying around the frying pan. They don't just immediately evaporate and pop off into space. They sort of survive for a period of time. And that's because the water in direct contact with the frying pan is converted to vapor. And that vapor phase of water acts as an insulating layer between the heat of the frying pan and the water droplet. And eventually the heat will get all the way through and the water droplet will evaporate. But essentially this is what's happening. That's a Leiden frost effect. In cryobiology or cryo microscopy, when we're trying to freeze something, if you're using liquid nitrogen, it is essentially around about minus 196 degrees C. If you, its boiling point is minus 195.85 degrees C. So if you introduce a, even a small warm sample into liquid nitrogen, you will easily raise the local temperature of the liquid nitrogen above its boiling point. And this will create a vapor phase of nitrogen and that will insulate the sample from the cooling performance of the liquid nitrogen itself. Essentially, it slows down the rate of cooling and then you will not get vitrification. There are techniques in cryo, and this is why I say that cryo can be employed in many labs around the world without sophisticated tools. If you take a pot of liquid nitrogen and pull a vacuum over it, you will actually start to boil it off and in turn reduce its temperature. You can make liquid nitrogen slush, and the liquid nitrogen slush will sit somewhere in the region of minus 208, 210 degrees C. And that should give you enough buffer zone to actually allow vitrification by plunging a small sample into the liquid nitrogen slush. However, if you're looking at the work with um, um, in, in, in structural biology, uh, cryo-electron microscopy, where we're trying to preserve thin films of, of, of cells or, or thin films of virus or proteins, what we're trying to use now is a plunge freezing approach going into an intermediate cryogen. In most cases today, it's ethane. Um, traditionally, propane was used quite heavily. And this is because of the large difference between the uh, solidification solid point and the boiling point for both of those, those intermediate cryogens. And if you cool ethane or propane in a crucible surrounded by liquid nitrogen, you can supercool it to close to minus 196 degrees C. Uh, essentially, there's no nucleation point, so the ethane and propane don't actually freeze. Um, and in this liquid state, this supercooled liquid state, when you plunge your sample into it, you don't raise it above its boiling point. There's no intervening uh, vapor phase, which slows down the rates of cooling. And then you have this million degrees C rate of cooling required to vitrify the sample. And this was first described and understood by Jacques Dubergé, Kent McDowell, 1981. You Jacques got his Nobel Prize for this, um, uh, 2017 from, from, from memory. Um, and without this, structural biology as we know it wouldn't exist today. So it's fantastic discovery and very, very easily implemented and on a day-to-day -day basis in any EM lab. And for, for cryo-TEM or viruses and proteins, all you require is a plunge freezer and a cryo rod to get your sample into TEM and then you can do cryo-electron microscopy. Looking at the bottom half of the, the slide here, the other approach to achieving vitrification is to exploit uh, pressure. 
So at 21,000 PSI, there's a triple point um, on what um, between the the liquid and and solid point vitrified state of water and essentially if you can cool through this this period of 20 23 degrees you can get it into a into a vitrified state when you release the pressure you have to make sure your sample is below its devitrification point and in this case you'll actually end up with a vitrified lump of tissue and the advantage of this um, over the plunge freezing approach, it's in principle you can vitrify up to 200 micrometers in depth. So you're opening up the potential to work with multicellular tissue blocks, uh, tissue biopsies and the like. So it's an incredibly powerful technique. Um, actually, more interesting is probably worth pointing out that this predated um, plunge freezing by, by a, a, a few years, certainly uh, around 10 or 12 years when it was developed by... Um, in Moore and Co. in uh, ETH, Switzerland. So if we take these two sort of approaches, this is Takayashi technique, just to give you an idea of how we would use it in, in CUI. This is a, a study from 2016 with um, Maria Teresa. Um, so she was interested in, in uh, hepatitis C virions and how they actually assembled inside the cell. Um, and she wanted immunoglobal label against various proteins, which she was interested in. This is actually an example of uh, dual label Takayashi technique, where we have two different sizes of gold ball uh, tagged to do two different antibodies to label up structures of interest inside the tissue. But you can see that the the ultra structure is maybe not as well preserved as you would have with a, a more conventional chemical fixation. But you do have the advantage of immunolabeling your tissue, and it's a it's a fairly rapid technique. We can turn around a sample like this in in a few hours. If you look at a high pressure frozen pre substituted data set, so this is using the high pressure freezing to vitrify a uh, an erythrocyte infected with malaria parasite. It's then substituted out, sections, and then the tomograms collected inside the TEM. You can see that the preservation of the ultrastructure is significantly better than we've seen in Takayashi technique. However, the immunolabeling efficiency is slightly lower in, in, in the case of these types of samples. But both are readily approachable inside an electron microscopy facility if they're properly equipped. Um, so in one case, you really only need a... Um, for Takayashi technique, you only require a cryo-ultra microscope and be able to work at minus 60 degrees C. Humidity isn't too much of a challenge because the sample will be brought back to room temperature and it's viewed at room temperature. So again, no special requirements on your transmission electron microscope. In the case of high pressure freezing for freeze substitution, you do require the high pressure freezer and a freeze substitution device. But again, afterwards, the sample is room temperature stable and can be viewed in any conventional TEM. Um, Greg may later on wish to discuss progressive lowering of temperature. It's the kind of poor man's version of high pressure freezing where you can lower the tap sample progressively, induce a degree of cryodehydration into the sample, replace it with solvents and resin at low temperatures, and then essentially end up with a halfway house between Takayashi technique and high pressure freezing. But it's not something I routinely perform in CUI these days. We have a high pressure freezer, which, which gets used um, most days of the week. Um, just to look at the plunge freezing approach and um, give you an example. So the bottom right hand corner gives you uh, an idea of what a, a frozen vitreous sample looks like inside the TEM. These are just um, individual um, HPV vaccine particles, which are um, frozen in a, in a monolayer of, 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 of their media. But the, side, the other side of the slide with happy smiley faces is adapted from um, Rado's paper in 2019, just showing the perils and challenges of, of, of plunge freezing samples for structural biology. In the ideal state, we want this. You want a whole load of perfectly separated, uh, randomly organized little particles to take pictures of, because what you're going to have to do is class average all the different orientations, and from that you'll generate your high, high resolution 3D volume. What you tend to get quite commonly is not enough particles. It's a bit sparse, which means an awful lot of imaging to get enough particles to get high resolution structure. This situation where the particles kind of get a bit stuck to the um, air liquid interface, and that in itself can change the shape and structure of the particle, which actually reduces your, your, your resolution. So even in this pure cryo environment, you can have artifacts which can affect the the the, you know, the, the ultrastructure, the, the resolution of your final data set. 
aggregation of particles is also quite common. Um, having a, a, a vitreous layer, which is a little bit too thick, so that when you image through the volume, the image you collect is actually uh, some form of average 2D image of multiple particles overlapping each other to different degrees. And probably the reality, you'll have a meniscus in the water because it's supported on a, on a quantifiable holy film, which means the middle bit is probably too thin. You probably got problems with the, the particles interacting with the surface. There's probably a happy zone and then other areas which are probably less less ideal from for taking your particles from. But again, this is going to be discussed at length in, in the next uh, presenter's talk. But what it will do is if you go through class averaging, which you can see here, and apply a, your appropriate processing tools using rely on or sparks, you can get really nice high resolution um, three dimensional data sets of, of proteins, particles and like. And this is a fairly low resolution data set compared to what can be done in um, the national facility in Brazil. So we start stepping this up a little bit and moving away from individual particles and in cryo. So one of the things we, we, we've done on malaria is actually try to look at the knob structure on the outside of the erythrocyte. So in this case, it wasn't really practical to use high pressure freezing free substitution. We wanted to look directly at the membrane itself. Um, and it's a little bit too thick to vitrify just by plunge freezing. It does, but it's not great. And there's an awful lot of material on the inside of the, the erythrocyte when the parasite is still, still located in it. So what we tended to do was actually lyse them to actually collect, collect the erythrocyte membrane and then plunge freeze the membrane itself. So essentially it's like a, a flat plane of lots of individual particles. And this works extremely well and allows you to then generate uh, tomographic information on, on those particular membranes. And from that extract out the, the, the structure of the knob itself and, and understand how it uh, interfaces into the sides of the skeleton underneath the, the knob. But if you want to take it up and actually look at the whole organism, it gets increasingly difficult. So this is an example from, from what we did in, in NIBSC. We were looking at um, vaccine resistance being developed in, in Nicera meningitis. Um, and what we were doing is actually plunge freezing the bacteria living on, on quantifiles and then actually using a, 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 a cationic ferritin to stain the lipid polysaccharide of the, the, the capsule to try and understand how this was changing in, re, in relation to vaccine um, resistance. But what it does show you is actually you can plunge freeze quite large things, but actually the middle of the sample is probably showing some um, ice crystal formation, and it's a little bit too thick for a 200 kV transmission electron microscope to actually get, get a beam through and generate a usable image. But the periphery of the cell, if I wanted to look at the, 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 the plasma membrane or, or outer membrane or physical production, is actually quite accessible. And Baumeister's group and Martin's Reed were probably one of the first groups to start applying this approach to cells um, in isolation. They would grow cells on grids, plunge freeze them, and actually carry out tomography and high resolution studies on the periphery of the cells, the areas which were actually correctly vitrified. Others, and this also comes from Jack Dubage's group, realized that they had to get a nice thin section to work with if they wanted to do tomography or higher resolution studies. And what they do is they perform a technique called SEMVIS. So this is cryo-electron microscopy of vitreous sections. And what you do is you high pressure freeze your sample, you load it into a cryo ultra microtome uh, around about minus 170 degrees C and then perform ultra microtomy at extremely low temperature and then collect the ribbon of vitreous slices. Uh, these will be about 50 nanometers thick. Each one's an individual slice um, and they're actually held together by essentially you know, static forces, van der Waals forces between each of the individual sections. So they are quite fragile. Um, they're also extremely prone to contaminating with any moisture in the atmosphere. So in this situation, humidity control becomes absolutely essential. Um, and I think the video at the bottom when it was playing showed you the cryosphere plastic box over the top of the ultra microtome, which is designed to keep the humidity low if, if you have dry nitrogen glass flow into there, around about 0.1% relative humidity. But what you do get is very, very nice thin sections through your, your cell or your, your tissue of interest. 
The top right is actually uh, an affected erythrocyte, so it's another malarial example. Um, those who are paying attention will realize that it looks an awful lot like a rugby ball. It's like a uh, lozenge shape. And this is due to compression artifacts. So as you're actually cutting this block of vitrified material, the forces on the leading edge of the diamond knife are such that they actually compress the sample in the direction it's been cut in. So rather than being spherical, it becomes um, oval. Um, it might not be essentially a problem for your study, but it is something which is which has to be understood if you're going to work on, on a semivis sample. You also get crevassing, uh, where the it's quite clear in the lower image on the, the right-hand panel, where the sample looks um, to be undulating, and that's the result of just actually the compression and actually trying to pick up these sections and keep them flat when you're mounting them onto a TEM grid. And in the top section as well, you can see these white score lines, and they're actually ice crystals scoring and cutting the, the vitreous surface during the cutting procedure. So highly technically demanding, um, incredibly powerful as a technique for the right studies, um, because they do show you every single membrane really in its native state with no heavy metal staining or osmotic um, damage to the tissue whatsoever but it is still prone to the compression artifacts. And this is where we're going to start moving on to sort of the modern techniques or the, the current strategy for overcoming all of these, these challenges. So I highlighted at the beginning one of the techniques, one of the hybrid techniques for cryo-EM was something called freeze fracture electron microscopy. So this was um, developed in the early, mid 1950s, 1960s, again in Switzerland. So what they discovered was if you vitrified your sample and then fractured it at low temperature in a, in a high vacuum environment, you could coat the surface of that fractured sample, and that's essentially just a broken sample surface, um, with a heavy metal, something like platinum, platinum carbon, from a single coating angle. And that would coat one side of the sample preferentially and leave the other lower surfaces, the surfaces not facing the electron gun, uh, uncoated. If you stabilize this um, surface with pure carbon, which is essentially electron transparent, and then dissolved away the material, you could get high resolution surface ultrastructure from your, your cells or tissue. And it was an incredibly powerful technique. It predated all the structural biology um, and really was the, the, the predecessor of, of, of structural biology with people trying to understand how membranes um, were, how proteins were assembled and inserted into membranes, whether or not they were you know, working on a, a transmembrane proteins or, or more localized on, on one of the, the surface faces or intracellular faces of, of, of a membrane. In more recent years, and the, the two final panels on, on the right show the same freeze fracture machines, but modified with vacuum transfer system. So this allows the sample to be fractured and coated um, at cryogenic temperatures with um, uh, an electron beam source, but then transferred in its frozen hydrated state directly to a field emission scanning electron microscope. And from there, you can actually take direct images of, of the surface at very, very high resolution. And this is just an example again of malaria by freeze fracture scanning electron microscopy. Uh, actually, the bottom left-hand panel gives you an example of, of freeze fracture transmission electron microscopy, just to show that you can now achieve um, probably better resolution in a, in a field emission scanning electron microscope. But you can see the organization of proteins on the, on the surface of the merozoite. You can see the knob structures here on the surface of the erythrocyte. Um, the merozoites assembled around about the residual body. And this is just different stages in the development of, of, of the parasite inside the the, the red blood cell. So with this in mind, you now have a technique with high pressure freezing, fracture, and a scanning electron microscope, which allows you to essentially get into a cell or a tissue in an almost perfectly native state. You know, there's, there's not the compression artifacts that you've seen with some of us, and there's none of the dehydration uh, artifacts you've seen with to Tokiashi technique. Um, or even some of the extraction artifacts you've seen with freeze, uh, freeze substitution. 
So we're going back to look at the microscope again. So this is your scanning electron microscope, um, electron beam scores, scanning electron column, sample down here with XY state, XYZ rotation movement, your detectors, backscatter detector, secondary electron detector. And these would detect either um, backscattered electrons or electrons um, coming off in this, in, on the secondary source. There is another type of instrument with an electron or, 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 or a, a, an ion column. So this is the focused ion beam instrument. So these have been around for decades now and they've been extremely popular in lithography. So essentially this is a, a, an, an ion source, normally gallium, which is used to um, mill or, or, or etch out a surface of interest. Normally they'll have something like a platinum deposition tool to help with charging, but essentially it's a very simple tool and it's been extremely popular in the material sciences, um, as I said, for, for, for decades. Probably more recently, um, the material scientists are way ahead of the life sciences in this. They, they came up with this brilliant idea of sticking the two things together. So this is a what is referred to as a FIB-SIM. So it's a focused ion beam scanning electron microscope. The great thing about this is essentially you have your scanning electron microscope device, which generates your lovely images, and a FIB, which essentially is going to function in much the same way as your ultra microscope, providing your sectioning of your tissue um, inside the SEM. So you can section an image, section an image, and this will allow you to form up an, an impression of the tissue or, or structure you're interested in. There are a few challenges. You need to make sure your two beams um, are coincident, and um, there's no point milling in one place and looking at a different location. Um, it sounds easy and fairly simple. It's not as straightforward under cryoconditions because you have to have a cryostage present. Um, but in the, the room temperature ones, actually, the, the most of them are me mechanically eccentric now and everything will align pretty much perfectly to the same point, which you can see here. If we're taking a little bit further and actually starting to get into the cryo environment, the life sciences. So the first thing we're really starting to add in here is a cryo stage. Um, to hold your sample at low temperature. We require an anti-contaminator. Essentially, there is moisture and contamination inside the system itself. And when you're FIB milling, you are generating contamination inside your chamber. So what you need is a colder surface to attract the particles and essentially lock these out of the chamber to prevent them from falling back onto the surface of your sample. You then require a source of... Um, cooling to keep the stage at a liquid nitrogen temperature. The simplest way to do this is a, is a liquid nitrogen dure. Um, you need to be able to load your sample into the, into the chamber under vacuum. There's no point vent venting your fib stem chamber and loading it at atmospheric conditions and then hoping to pump it down. The sample will be destroyed and, and contaminated long before you get to take an image of it. So we use a vacuum transfer system which will connect to the outside of the, the, the FIBSEM, and this will allow the, the frozen vitreous sample to be loaded under control conditions into, into the middle of the chamber. You need some form of connected liquid nitrogen dure. I, in CUI, use a conductive cooling. It's provided by Leica Microsystems. It's on a Joel FEGSEM. Um, and this essentially has liquid nitrogen on the outside of this of, of the, the, the FIBSEM, and it's braided um, copper connections go to the cryostage and that maintains the cryostage temperature um, around about minus 170 degrees C with the anti-contaminator sitting around about minus 190 degrees C. This gives us a perfect working environment. Um, we want to be able to run for extended periods of time so we can actually fib mill lamella or volumes. Um, so to do this we require a continuous um, liquid nitrogen supplies. So we have a, a supply dure connected um, with a, an insulated liquid nitrogen supply pipe and a pump at the end of it. And because this isn't in physical contact with any part of the FIBSEM, essentially it's a vibration isolated um, cooling system. So we have nothing on the, fib, on the, on the FIBSEM side which will generate vibration um, and then we can maintain the system cold for, well, weeks at a time. We tend to cool on a Monday, warm up on a Friday. If you want to come in on a Saturday and Sunday, it will keep going. But it tends to be a five-day operation in, in CUI these days. And we have a cryo shield for tra transferring. So you can see here the shuttle on the far right, uh, the samples um, vitrified, loaded onto its 
onto its block. It has a little cold shield over the top of it. You can see it here, which protect, prevents it from getting any contamination during the transfer stages. And once it's put into the middle of the FibSem, the shield is opened and then you can access your sample for milling. So there's two ways we use this. Um, the first is to generate lamella. Um, this is just basically an extremely expensive cryo ultramicrotome. It does nothing other than create very thin um, sections of material, which then go into the TEM. And everything we do with this is based upon cryotomography. So what you can see here, um, this will be uh, euglenoid. So we, we use euglena gracilis as one of our test samples. Um, it's been, um, it was in a, in a water solution, they swim around quite happily when they're when they're when they're living. Um, this is a quantifier grid. You can see the perforated structure. The 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 cell in a small droplet of water, plunge frozen uh, to vitrify it, and then you apply these two boxes where you wish to have them to mill out using the gallium source. Um, an area above and below the the area of interest, and this leaves essentially a thick lamella. From there, we then go through um, polishing. We will actually thin down the lamella to somewhere between 50 and 200 nanometers, depending on the, the, the project we're, we're aiming for. Uh, this will be a 100 nanometer thick section. And within this, you can see the structures of membranes, organelle are quite clearly visible. This sample is then transferred through to the transmission electron microscope. And this just gives you an idea of the little euglenoids sitting on the surface of the of the quantifier on on the TEM grid. This is the um, a, a slightly higher resolution image inside the the FibSem. We don't tend to image them at such high resolution because we don't want to put any beam induced damage into them. But for the cases of a presentation, it's nice to see something. You can see the organelles and structures are present inside the lamella itself. Um, it's extremely thin. And then this is transferred into the TM, and we use a, a lamella overview to actually locate the same areas of interest. And we can load either autogrid type, um, which are commonly found in thermal fissure, uh, creos type microscopes, or this style, which is the Joe um, cryoarm type loading device. One of the advantages here is that actually the samples are fib milled inside the cartridge. So the orientation for tilting for tomography is maintained perfectly during the entire transfer process. And then this is the sort of thing you would get to see if you took a 2D image of, of your sample inside the cryo TEM, your uh, ribosomes, mitochondria, et cetera, are all really clearly visible. And from these, you can apply um, subtomographic averaging approaches. You can box out um, structures of interest uh, class average them and then generate three-dimensional high resolution data from them. And this opens up this wonderful workflow for, for structural biology. The top workflow is, is essentially routine um, in, in a number of labs now where individual cells are grown and um, perhaps viewed and, and regions of interest selected using um, confocal epifluorescent approaches. They are plunge frozen directly on the grid. Um, they may be, the presence of fluorescence can be confirmed using cryo um, light microscopy. And then these cells which are adhered to the grid, essentially the way as I've shown you with euglena, are milled to generate a thin lamella, which goes to the TEM for tomography. And from here, structures can be picked out for, for subtomographic averaging. The emerging trend uh, is probably the bottom half of the, 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 the slide. Essentially, it is more interesting to look at multicellular in tissues and tissue biopsies. To prepare these in a way that's suitable for cryo-electron tomography, you have to use high pressure freezing, otherwise your vitrification depth is insufficient. The same approaches of confirming regions of interest can be performed using cryolite microscopy. However, this step here is really the late rate limiting and challenging step because essentially inside the FibSem, you have to be able to cut thick blocks out of your high pressure frozen tissue. 
move the thick block onto a TEM grid without damaging it, contaminating it, melting it, etc. Bond it to the grid and then thin it down to a point where it's electron transparent. And this step essentially is the lamella lift out technique. Um, there are a few labs doing it well. Um, it is challenging, but it's almost certainly the major direction of travel for, for structural biology, high end cryo electron tomography of cells and tissues. Now, I think this was shown uh, probably by the, the, the earlier presenter today, uh, Richard Lehman. So he, he uses structural um, three view or volume imaging to actually understand neural networks. And essentially he uses conventionally chemically fixed tissue, um, which is heavy metal stained, and then images it inside a, an SEM type system to actually generate large volumes, which can then be processed and you know, modeled to understand the the organization of of of, of neural networks in, in in tissue biopsies this is extremely powerful but as i've really been sort of pushing cryotechniques all the way through it does suffer from quite severe artifacts in terms of the chemical fixation the extraction steps which has gone through and the shrinkage um which the tissue experiences during processing it's probably around about a third of the its original volume if you take the FibSEM a little bit further and, and start playing with it as a cutting tool and using its detectors to actually generate volumes, you can essentially create three-dimensional volumes of vitrified tissue inside the FibSEM. And this is just a really early example of yeast plunge frozen on a grid and then sectioned and reconstructed as a three-dimensional volume. It's fun um it's got a lot of potential um and it's something we're now working on quite extensively in cui and um, to really try and optimize the, the the various steps in this workflow we have a phd student working on this currently so really just to conclude and sort of point out there's been a, a number of changes um along the way cryobiology structural biology is a major area of interest it knew globally these days certainly since the Nobel prizes were given out in in 2017 to Richard Henderson Jacques Dubergé and Joachim Frank but a lot of the techniques and and tools predate them by quite a substantial period um looking at um your Mollish's um cryo light microscope which was originally used to look at desiccative stress on plant cells um got in the 1800s or so, to Chris Polch and Audrey Smith in the early 1950s, looking at cryopreservation of, of spermatozoa, um, to the Lincoln cryo stage, which really empowered cryopreservation research for, for decades. And actually that, that stage is, is actually the basis of your cryo light microscope stage, which, which underpins all of these these new fangled techniques in terms of structural biology and, and cryofib um, milling of, of, of tissues for, for, for tomography. So really with that, um, I'm happy to take questions. Hopefully it was interesting and it highlights the, the value and, 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 and use of cryotechniques in, in, in electron microscopy. Thank you very much, Roland. Still there? There we go. Yeah. Thanks. I think I'm back. Stop sharing. Yes. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? I don't see. Uh, uh, yeah, there's one I see here. Uh, well, asking if we have this at UFMG. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can we see cytoplasmic protein aggregation areas with this cryo-electron tomography? Cytoplasmic aggregations and what sort of aggregations? If there are protein aggregations, then yes. Uh, yeah, you should. Yeah, it's, I'm not quite sure about what the aggregation areas are, but 
Yeah, any we do have a natural. We have a study which is, which is aggregations in cells. You so the, they are they want to use cryolamella production to get to the aggregate and then go from there to tomography. So yeah, I I would say yes, you um, might be able to do it with straight plunge freezing, Greg, if it's a thin enough part of the cell. Yeah, these. Um, I mean, I'll just make the comment. So we we do have this sort of equipment here. We haven't been using it like what you're doing with sections or this material. We usually use it a lot with um, uh, liposomes and uh, small uh, the secreted par particles from cells. We're doing a lot of that sort of analysis. Um, of course, you there are a lot of other materials you can imagine that you can do. But anything that you can do in the cell, we don't. Don't have the capabilities yet to do the cryo fib sem uh, Kildare, who we'll talk tomorrow. So they uh, killed him around us in UF uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. And so they uh, they they recently got uh, won a big grant. So they will be purchasing a large cryo M microscope with a cryo fib sem. And so they should, they will be able to do these same, same sorts of lamella and cut sections and then and do, do the analysis. So um, I don't know anybody else in the world. Uh, Rodrigo is here. Go ahead, Rodrigo. Hi. Hi, Greg. How, hi, Holland. Uh, hi, Rodrigo. Hi. Holland, thank you very much this for, for this talk. It's, it's, well, excellent talk. And I, I was just wondering, as you showed some uh, images of lamellas, I mean, it's an it's a extremely uh, crowded environment, right? And how, how in far- In terms of the number of particles? In, in terms, yeah. I mean, it's a cell, it, there's lots of proteins. Yeah. Full of stuff, yeah. How, how far you think we can go on identifying like smaller proteins like small proteins in this environment to to do subtomogram average like how, how do you see that i know i'm not in the field but yeah. like i follow that people are really thinking about the challenge of going further so how do you I think, think it, that? i think it comes down to the quality of your fib sem if you can cut routinely thin and avoid damaging your lamella then you just remove a lot of that you know, complexity. Um, you know, I know a lot of the groups have sort of used sort of 200 nanometer thick or thicker sections because they've really only gotten to tomography. Um, you know, it, it's a difficult process. You, we're routinely cutting down to 50 nanometers, which is actually getting quite thin. There's, it's not overcrowded. Um, it is definitely easier to transfer the sample around if it's connected to the Joe cryo arm cartridge because it's physically locked and I don't lose orientation on the lamella because I don't have to um, ensure that I, I mount it on you as you would do on, on, a, on a Creos to ensure that the lamella is covering your tilting angle. But I think it probably comes down to the thinness of the lamella and, and its accessibility. Um, at, at this point in time. Okay, thank you. But I, you, but also just making it easy. And you, the other, you, at, at one level, if it's really difficult to do, and you're getting one lamella every so often, and it's extremely challenging, it, you're you're going to find it hard to get good data. Um, we are, you know, we've taken a bit of time to get things optimized. You know, it's, it's it's taken us time to refine the instrument, but. Where we are now this year, I don't think I don't think we've actually lost a lamella. I think every single sample that's been loaded, we've successfully cut 10, 20 lamella on every single grid that's that's gone in, recovered it successfully, and been able to get it to a TEM. Um, that's quite nice throughput. Um, we can train, we trained the new PhD student to cut lamella in in less than a month. And she'd never seen an electron microscope in her life before. Um, and she's now routinely generating volume images, does the whole thing herself, plunge freezes, loads the whole lot, sets it up um, and cuts. So I, I think if you have it well set up, it's a very approachable technique now or becoming very approachable.
Thank you. Yeah, I see these too. The uh, the things that Roland has been talking about is looking at more at the complexes that are within cells. And so the cells alter structure in a native state. And Rodrigo will talk in just a few minutes. And it's looking at more of the, the single particle of purified proteins or large structures, membrane receptors, these sorts of things. So these two things are running parallel, but they're really very, very closely related. You can see what something looks like uh, by itself, but then you can imagine better when you see it, or vice versa, when you see it in the in the cell, and then you can also have the structure that's an isolated subunit. So it makes interpretation much easier, but it's all done with Creo. In the past, it was very difficult to do this with uh, fixed material because just what Roland said, a lot of shrinkage, artifacts, hard to determine. So people are finding now when they make um, or study mutant proteins that they can find things that they never saw before when they use these techniques. So the various diseases. So all of the sorts of things I think is making bioimaging uh, advanced techniques. And uh, you know I'm very partial to the cryo EM field. So I, I think it's got a, a huge potential in the future. So uh, are there any other questions here or? Okay, uh, Roland again, thank you very much. I'm looking forward for you to visit here in, in Belo Horizonte again. We'll do our regular tour of, you know, all the places. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll find a, find, find a watering hole. Ho hopefully Rodrigo might make it as well. Um, a beer would be good. Yeah. And remember to find a race for me. <laughs> yeah. I'm really not doing it in Portuguese. <laughs> 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 okay, thanks Roland. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Rodrigo, um, uh...